So recently, uh, we uh, were driving and started noticing in our van that as we were going, that there'd just kind of be this, this rumbling happening. And, um, and it happened periodically and sporadically. And our first thought was, man, there must be some construction going on in the road. Uh, there must be some potholes or some things going on. And uh, so we just kind of chalked it up to that. And the rumbling kept happening and it started getting kind of worse. And so we decided to be like, man, I'm gonna start paying attention to what's going on here. And I realized that every time we reached 55 miles an hour, no matter where we were, the car started to shake. And so then I started realizing, okay, this isn't the road. It's not the street we're on. It's something with the car. So I took it to my mechanic and I'm like, hey, anywhere between 55 and 60 miles an hour, our car starts to, sh starts to shake. Um, less speed than that doesn't shake. More than speed than that doesn't shake. And he just goes, oh, it's the balance in your tires is off, which was such a relief to me uh, because at that point he just looks, he's like, yeah, just take it over to the tire shop. They can fix your balance and then you'll be good to go. And uh, the reason I tell that story is uh, we've uh, experienced a year filled with things shaken up and things feeling off balance. And it's easy to look backwards and just to be like, well, that's why. It's that dip in the road. It's that construction going on. It's that thing. And looking forward, um, what I really just sense in my heart is to say, well, yes, there are some uneven places. There are some things, some detours. There's some things that are circumstantial. But what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do in us might look like readjusting the balance of our own souls and not just waiting for circumstances to change. There's an internal work that he wants to do that's out of balance. Even though we know that the years ahead of us, we can't predict everything. And so as I've been spending time praying for this year, 2021, I've just been asking the Lord, well, how, how do we do that? How do we stop looking for the bumps in the road? And how do we start welcoming the reorientation and the rebalancing of our own souls uh, based on the scriptures and who Jesus is? And so here's, here's what I'm sensing the Holy Spirit speak to our church is when things seem complex to go back to simplicity. When it seems that what we can't know in the future, let's focus on what we do know. And so my invitation to you for 2021 is would you walk with Jesus? Walking is a common illustration used throughout scripture uh, to denote what it means to journey with God. Jesus invites people not to just an intellectual conversion, but onto a journey. He says, follow me, walk with me. Paul in his letter to the Galatians talks about how we are to walk and keep in step with the Spirit. And so what would it look like, rather than focusing on trying to predict every bump and turn and twist that 2021 is gonna bring, and what if we asked Jesus to come and to rebalance our hearts and our lives and our souls. And in order to do that, I wanted this to go back to something that's kind of a core identity about our church. And it's that our job as a church is not built around methods. It's not built around a place. Uh, it's not built around uh, just kind of some of the more pragmatic things of how things go on. It's, it's built around the person of Jesus. And the person of Jesus uh, had a way of bringing about this revolution throughout the world. And it was through inviting people to walk with him. And there was three goals laid out for disciples or students of this rabbi called Jesus. And the three goals were this, to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. These were the common goals of any student following their rabbi. And Jesus being a first century Jewish rabbi had these three same goals for his apprentices. 
And so again, our goal as we look into 2021 is what would it look like for us to have that same goal and ambition? John Mark Homer has this quote, we have reduced the role of Christians to having Jesus follow us around rather than us following Jesus around. So what would it look like for us 2021 to go back to the simplistic invitation of Jesus to walk with him, to follow him, to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. And so I wanted to focus on a scripture, um, really kind of a larger portion of scripture at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry, because we're at the very beginning of a year. And this text takes place right before, it's kind of the setup for the very first invitation to follow him, the very first invitation to come walk with me, given to Peter and Andrew, um, is, is the story is laid out as kind of a precursor to this. So three things I wanted to just kind of just lay out. Number one is that in this story, the familiar spaces, which is Nazareth, they miss Jesus's authority. Where the unfamiliar space, Capernaum, they marveled at Jesus's authority. Second, the felt presence of Jesus sustains us while the future promise of Jesus compels us. And third, that the Father's plan, priorities, and presence has to be primary, and that the culture's plans, priorities, and presence has to be secondary. And so we find ourselves in this Luke's Gospel of chapter four, and there is a story where Jesus comes out of the desert, filled with the Holy Spirit, and begins his ministry. And he goes and starts his ministry in his hometown of Nazareth. And so there's this dramatic scene in Luke chapter four, where he goes and he goes into the synagogue. And the synagogue was kind of the, the community center. It was kind of a smaller place in the middle of the town where weddings were had, meetings were had. And on Sabbath, you would go and have the scriptures read. Well, Jesus shows up and Luke 4, 14 says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him sped throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. A few verses down, verse 22, it says that all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. And they said, isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Which doesn't seem like a big deal, but as the story unfolds, they get to the place where they're so upset that Jesus, the son of Joseph, that they grew up knowing and they, they saw him grow up, all of a sudden is saying these massive words that we'll talk about in a second. And they are so upset that they're trying to take his life and Jesus has to escape. This familiar place, Nazareth, this place that knew Jesus, or they thought they knew Jesus, completely was missing him. And so it says, the very next thing says, then he went to Capernaum, which is about 44 miles away. We're taking him two or three days to walk there. And on the next Sabbath, it says, then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. All the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are. With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. And so I wanted to just highlight what the author's trying to get. There's Nazareth, the familiar, and there's Capernaum, the unfamiliar. It's within the familiar that the authority of Jesus is missed, it's mocked. But in Capernaum, the unfamiliar, there's space for this wonder, there's space for this awe, for this marveling at the authority of Jesus. And, and the reason why I wanna bring this up was because we are in a season, a, a, a cultural moment that feels unfamiliar. And my hope is that in the unfamiliarity that we would actually position and posture ourselves to see Jesus in a whole new light. Because the reality is when things get familiar, we begin to start thinking that God is predictable. When things get familiar, we begin to start thinking that God is tame and he's safe. But it's in the unfamiliar that all of a sudden our faith has to raise up. It's in the unfamiliar that all of a sudden we are looking towards and at Jesus with greater intensity than ever before. And so as we enter into a new year, the idea isn't to be 
to regain familiarity within our context, but rather to recognize this is unfamiliar territory. What an opportunity for us not to miss the authority of Jesus, but to marvel at the authority of Jesus in our midst, in our presence. I mean, I can't think of something that is a deeper cry of my heart. That I, the reality is I don't know when we're ever gonna be back in the building again, what this year holds for us as a church, but the reality is more than anything is I want our church, our community, whoever you are watching this, to, gra- to gain a new sense of marveling at the authority of Jesus in this unfamiliar territory. Second thing I wanna point out about this passage is you might be like, what, what was Jesus teaching that was causing one town to be so upset at him and another town to just be so amazed? Well, it says here that when Jesus stood up, he read from the prophet Isaiah, a passage 700 years before. He, he unrolls the scroll, has to find it, and, then he, and he reads this passage out of Isaiah 61. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, I don't know if you picked up on the audacity of this statement, but Jesus reads this dense messianic prophecy that the poor are going to have news, the oppressed are going to be free, that the blind are going to have sight. And Israel identifies themselves as those things. They're oppressed, they're poor, they're blind, they're underneath the Roman rule. And Jesus, in the synagogue, underneath Roman oppression, says, Today, these words, these 700-year-old prophetic hope-filled words are fulfilled. Now, two things need to be marked out. Number one is that according to Jesus, his presence in that synagogue, his presence in the earth was so powerful that he could say that everything about that sentence, even though it was yet to be fully realized, had been fully fulfilled in him. Which means for us, if we still feel poor, if we still feel insecure, if we still feel imprisoned and trapped, if we still feel blind in, in these metaphorical kinds of ways, it's the presence of Jesus that is so powerful back then as it is right now through his Holy Spirit for us to recognize it's fulfilled in his hearing. Jesus puts a such a high emphasis on his presence being there with them on the earth that we can't miss it today. Jesus is present to us. He's with us. And that changes everything. And so that's kind of the, the first half of this coin is recognizing the power of the presence of Jesus to sustain us. But the second is the future promise that compels us. There is an element to this passage when for the good news for the poor, for the liberation for the oppressed, for the sight to the blind, that our hearts are still longing for. And and this, this season has just kind of unmasked that, that th- no matter how progressed our culture has become, there's still something when it, in us that is deeply longing for wholeness, deeply longing for restoration. And it's within this statement that the presence of Jesus brings fulfillment to that. But the future promise that Jesus is coming again compels us to keep moving forward, to keep marching on, to recognize that this is not our home and that we are heading towards something filled with eternal hope and salvation. And lastly, One thing we notice in Luke chapter 4 is after these two incidents in the synagogues of Nazareth and Capernaum, Jesus does these miracles. And then it says this. It says, At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns, because that's why I was sent. 
and he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. I love this. Jesus begins his ministry and momentum is at an all-time high. And what does he do? At daybreak, he went out to a solitary place. That's his model, right? We're an apprentice of Jesus, which means in the different seasons of our life, the model that he gives us is for us to come away with him, to spend time with our heavenly father. And it's within this place that the pressure of the culture of saying like, Jesus, look at this momentum, look at all these people coming. He actually stops and says, no, I, I'm listening to the voice of my father and I'm going to let him dictate my mission, my timing, my priorities, my plan. And I can't think of something that more the core of my heart that I desire than for us to stop feeling the pressure and the, and the plans and the priorities of the culture around us, but for that to be secondary to the priority and the plans and the presence of our Heavenly Father. And I, and I hope you understanding here, this is, again, this is literally the moment before Jesus invites his first people to do what I'm doing right now, just walk with him, spend time with him. And what is the emphasis on? His presence. Is his presence welcomed and received? Is it rejected? Is his presence realized, the fulfillment, the totality of what that brings, or is it minimized? Is his presence captured? Because for Jesus, it was so important for him to have presence with his heavenly father. He wants us to have that same priority for us to have presence with him. That 2021 would be the year marked by not just religious rituals, not just by are we in a building, or are we outside? Can we sing, can't we sing? But it's marked by are we walking with Jesus? Are we walking with Jesus? In Brother Lawrence's book, The Practices of the Presence of God, he puts it so simply. He kind of demystifies this whole kind of religiosity around what this could look like. He says this, There's not in the world a kind of life more sweet and delightful than that of continual conversation with God. Those only can comprehend it who practice and experience it. God does not ask much of us, merely a thought of Him from time to time, a little act of adoration, sometimes to ask for His grace, sometimes to offer Him your sufferings, and other times to thank Him for grace past and present. He has bestowed on you in the midst of your troubles to take solace in Him as often as you can. Lift up your heart to Him during your meals and in His company. The least little remembrance will always be pleasing to Him. One need not to cry out very loud. And here's one of my favorite lines. He is nearer to us than we think. Loved ones, I don't know your situation and your circumstances. I can't pretend to know the weight that you feel. What I do know is that God is near to the brokenhearted. What he wants more in 2021 is more of you unified with him. And that's the invitation that no matter what this year brings, it's extended to us. Would you walk with Jesus? Grab a Lectio Divina journal, right? Grab a friend, challenge each other to read. S schedule time in your calendar to go and walk and to pray. But don't think that we can expect the life of Jesus without adopting the lifestyle of Jesus. This is crucial for us to know. You know those, those tires that were out of balance? I thought it was the road, but really it was my tire. You know what the best part was? When I took it to the tire store, it was free. It was paid for. The presence of Jesus in our life is free. It doesn't cost us anything. We don't have to clean up ourselves. It's just given to us. But will you receive it? Will you step into it? Will you recognize the nearness of Jesus in a year that we need it more than ever? Let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you so much. 
you've drawn near to us through the person of Jesus Christ, your only Son, and our giving of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us not miss this gift. Lord, not, not just the availability of it, but the substantial nature of it. Lord, teach us to walk with you, Jesus. Teach us to, what it means to be your apprentice, to be with you, to do what you do, Lord God, to become like you. I love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.